All right, good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming out. So great to see you and all of our campuses. Thank you for joining us as we are landing a series today called Shame and Shelter. And we're going to pick back up next week with a new series called Chaos and Confidence. And I hope you will join us for that. We've been in the, new, uh, the Old Testament now for two years, walking book by book. We started at Genesis, and we've just been marching book by book all the way through. We've stopped and paused and done some other things, but, but we're going to land the Old Testament starting in the series next week. I can't believe it. All these dozens of, of messages. So I hope you'll come back. But today, Shame and Shelter with a book called Zephaniah. So let's pray and we'll dig in. Lord, thank you for all joining us for this hour. And we plead in the name of Jesus that your Holy Spirit will move, will speak. It is in vain that we are here without you. So open our hearts to the scriptures. Open the scriptures to our hearts, I plead in Jesus' name. Amen. Anybody like French press coffee? Anybody out there? All right, real coffee drinkers. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, so I thought this year I'm going to ditch Keurig for a while. I'm going to go, to go French press coffee. I'm going all the way, though. I'm ordering the beans, the whole, the whole beans, and putting it in a grinder, and you put it in the press, and you pour the whole hot water all the way up to the top, and you stir it real good, and then you put the top on, and you press the the coffee grounds all the way to the bottom where you get that pure nectar of coffee, that good, strong, glorious Turkish coffee. That's my favorite coffee. And it's good until you get to the bottom. And then the, 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 then the, the, the sediment, right, the sediment and the sludge begins to sneak out into the cup of coffee, and it makes it a little too much, a little too bitter to drink. Do you know the scriptures actually speak toward sludge? And sediment in the heart. Let me show you. Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 12. God says through the prophet Zephaniah, At that time I will search Jerusalem with lamps, and I will punish the men and women who are complacent. And that word complacent in the original language is to have sludge in the soul, a sediment in your heart. It's an image of being complacent or indifferent or apathetic toward the Lord God. Are you apathetic toward the Lord God today? Have you been indifferent toward the Lord God in your heart? Have you been complacent in the Lord God, toward the Lord God in your heart? I hope we come, and this is a place we can get serious about these matters, a place you can be honest before the Lord. It's okay not to be okay. Don't stay there. And the first truth you need to need to confront today, according to Zephaniah, is to search. So when we read scripture and we preach, that's what we do. We open our hearts to be searched by the lamp of God. So the context of Zephaniah is that he's called of God to preach, to prophesy to the nation of Israel. And what's interesting about him is that he's the great, great, great grandson of King Hezekiah. So what's happening is, is he's and that's important because if I was the great, 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 great grandson of Abraham Lincoln, I think that would be pretty cool to know or, or be helpful to know. So he's that with Hezekiah. And what he's saying to the people, beginning with, he's saying, people, I'm one of you. Because the book's mainly written toward the people of Judah, God's people. And Zephaniah's first saying, I'm one of you. This message is for you. This message is for me. And then he says, but I'm also up here in the top tier of the nation. I see leaders, I see decisions they're making, and I see the oppression and the injustice that's, that, they, that they portray on, on the people. Because as the leaders go, the people go. And so he's calling out injustice, oppression. He's calling out that from the leadership and then all the way down into the people. And he, he, he couches it in sediment, sludge, indifference, apathy, a, a complacency toward God and even the things of God. So with that said, the, the, the question, two questions we're going to answer together. One is, what, what are the signs? If you're not sure if you're really complacent or indifferent toward the Lord, all right, well then what are the signs that you are that I am? And then secondly, how do we get out of it? So first, the signs. I'm just going to put them all up there at one, in one strike, and we'll touch on them briefly, and then we'll dig into the rest. So here are the signs that you're indifferent, apathetic, complacent, sludge, sediment in the heart that can make you bitter and toxic. First, idolatry. So Zephaniah 1, 5, and 6, God says to the prophet, I will cut off those who bow down on the roofs to the host of the heavens. So now he's speaking toward what, applying it in our day, new age spirituality, 
I've talked about the little magic shop down the road from me that's really big on tarot cards and palm reading, and then there's horoscopes and astrology. All that nonsense is evil, and it can bring a complacency in your heart or, or already reveals it is there. To those who bow down and swear to the Lord and yet swear by Milcom. So he's saying this is idolatry in the sense that you have the Lord on the throne of your heart, and you're not saying, get out of here, Lord. You're just saying, move over, Lord. Because what I really love, I put here beside you, Lord. I'm not. I'm still here today at church, and you know I'm still going to be here, and I'm going to pray maybe, and 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 I'm going to try to be good. But really, it's this I can't live without. It's it's him, it's her, it's them that I can't. I'll never make it if something happened to them. If I didn't have this, I wouldn't have worth. That is really what I worship. So that can bring a complacency and a toxicity in the heart. Then he says, those who have turned back from following the Lord, and they do not seek the Lord or inquire of him. What's interesting is they're still coming to church. They're still coming to worship. But even as they come to church, they're not seeking the Lord. They're not inquiring of the Lord. It's a ritual. It's just what they do. Sunday comes, you go to church, you go home and watch football. Whatever that looks like in your life, but that's what's called out here. That's, that's revealing their sediment in the heart. So there you go. One is idolatry. Secondly is self-sufficiency. Do not, it says those who do not seek the Lord or, or inquire of him. So if you're prayerless, it just shows you're self-sufficient. I mean, we all can grow in our prayer life, absolutely. But if your prayer life is kneel, if you're not seeking and inquiring, it shows that you've got it. Self-sufficient. Also, it could show that God just really is irrelevant to you. He's good for a Sunday, but he's irrelevant the rest of the days. Zephaniah 1 verse 12, At that time I will search Jerusalem with lamps, and I will punish the men and women who are complacent. Those who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do ill. It's just he's irrelevant. I don't give him really much of a thought. Then there's this, what I've learned, called practical atheism that a Christian can live with. Zephaniah 2.15, this, the this, this is the exultant city that lives securely, that said in her heart, I am and there is no one else. So you can be a believer. I, I don't know if you are truly a believer, but you can say you believe and you come to church and put in your time and then go live your life. But in the end... Are you really, is, does, your, is, does your life show that you are and there is no one else? You handle your money as you are and there is no God that you are accountable to. The way you treat people means I am and there is no one else. What, what shows that up in your heart and in your life? That's complacency, a place of indifference, a practical atheism. Also, it shows up in your money, Zephaniah 1.18. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to save them on the day of the Lord's wrath. So do you, have, do you put that kind of weight and money in front of you? Do you go to bed thinking about money? Do you wake up thinking about money? Do you go throughout your day thinking about money and security and the future and all that? And I'm not saying that's a negative thing, but I'm saying if it owns you, it shows what's really in your heart. So there's idolatry, there's self-sufficiency, and then thirdly, there's just flat-out ungodliness. Chapter 3, verse 13, God mentions the pure speech, or the imp and, and backdoor, the impure speech talks about living a lie or telling lies, self-deception, and deceiving others. If your speech is cur if there's cursing in your speech or coarse joking in your speech, those show that there's something wrong in your heart. Jesus said, out of the heart, the mouth speaks. So it shows there's sediment there. It shows there's, there's, there's sludge there. And out of that comes from your heart, lying, all of that, ungodliness. Is your life godly, right? with God and right before others. So that's a sign of complacency. Fourth, pride. And I'm, what, I, what I see here is not just pride as a kind of a broad banner, but a stubbornness in your heart in this way. Watch, Zephaniah 3, 2. She listens to no voice. She accepts no correction. That's mentioned twice in Zephaniah. Accepts no correction. Does not trust in the Lord and does not draw near to her God. So what ought to happen when there's a correction that comes from God in your life it ought to move your heart to, to turn to the Lord, to place deeper trust in the Lord and want to draw nearer to the Lord. But the issue is where the complacency shows up is that you don't learn your lesson. You're not, you're not understanding the correction of God. The correction of God can come right now, right here, through my voice. 
Don't you wish that's all it took? Don't you wish it, all, that would, all it took for God to correct us is just hear a good sermon? It usually takes a lot more than that, right? It takes life and hurt and pain that God uses, whether he permits it or brings it or allows it, but in the end, it's to get our attention and place it upon God. But are you being stubborn and continuing in your own way of things? Shows that a heart is toxic toward God. And then fifth is just flat-out weariness. Anybody weary today? Because you look at, at Zephaniah, there's injustice, oppression, evil, enemies, suffering, sadness, shame. There's a place where God says, strengthen the weakness, meaning you're weary. We can be weary. Are you weary? Weariness can just make your heart grow cold. It can make your heart sludge and make it sediment and, and then bitter tasting and toxic. Weariness can do that as well. So where are you today? Where do you find yourself today? Anywhere in that place? Well, the question then is, how do we get out of that place? What can we do to have our hearts stirred anew out of that sediment of complacency in our lives? I see this just plainly, the way that is, is, a, is moved out of our lives, is this, to worship, to worship the Lord with your, with your voice, with your ears, with your eyes, with your lips, with your life, to worship him. Because here's what worship means. Worship means Focus and response. Worship means you focus first upon the Lord. You don't, work, you don't walk in here and got to work up my worship. No, you walk in or you live life with your eyes on the Lord, his attributes, his character, his grace, his mercy, his love, his greatness, and you focus on him. And then as you focus upon him, out of that comes a response, and that's worship. It's focus, response, focus, response, worship. And that's what can stir the sediment out of you the complacency from you. So what are we to fo- what, how are we to worship? What are we to focus upon and then respond to to break you and me out of any complacency in our lives? I'm so glad you're asking these great questions. Because here's the first way. Marvel that God is sovereign. Focus upon God as sovereign, that he is in control. This is the, the, the declaration of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation. He is God, and he is in control. He is sovereign. Watch this, Zephaniah 1.7. Be silent before the sovereign Lord. Through all these prophets, this is a reminder, too, that God is sovereign. Just Zephaniah alone, watch this. God is sovereign over the face of the earth, over people, over animals, over birds, over fish over weather, over nations, over hearts. If I poke around in Scripture a little bit, we'll find Proverbs 16, 33 that says the dice is cast, but it's every decision is of the Lord. You see in Proverbs 21, 1, it says God takes the heart of a king and channels it like streams of water wherever he wants it to go. Throughout the Old Testament, it says that God whistles at nations, and when he whistles for them, they come running like dogs, obedient. John chapter 3 verse 27 says that you and I receive nothing unless it is first given from heaven. Also Isaiah 45 7 says that God says of himself that he is the God of well-being and the God of calamity, meaning that he's in control over it all. Whether he brings it, whether he allows it, whether he permits it, it all is under God's sovereignty. He is, as I say and I truly try to pound into us, He is the oceans, we are the thimble. You cannot fit the oceans in the thimble. You cannot understand it. You can't make it logical because he's God and we are not. He is sovereign and in control and operates in ways our thimbles will never understand. That's why it's helpful when we go through the stuff, the suffering, the pain, the the confusion of life, the weariness that comes from it, is to understand we are like children in the moment looking at a puzzle piece or maybe a couple puzzle puzzle pieces of a a thousand-piece puzzle. And we sit down and all we can, and understandably so, when we go through the pain, all we see is the puzzle, puzzle piece. And we take this puzzle piece and we take this one and we try to fit them together. That doesn't work. And you get frustrated and you get upset and you're like, what's wrong with this? There's something wrong. And then dad shows up and he puts the whole thousand piece puzzle together. And you look at it all together and you go, oh, so that's what it means. 
In the same way is to understand that God is sovereign and we are thimbles, he is oceans. And we only see a couple of puzzle pieces when we experience it. And when we try to fit it together, it doesn't make sense. It seems that God is mean. We are confused and we ask how and we ask why. But then we got to understand God's got the whole puzzle put together. And on this side of heaven, we may not get the whoa. But on that side, with God, I believe the ah is coming. So marvel that your God is sovereign. Is your God too small? Or do you understand him to be great and sovereign? So focus that God is sovereign. Secondly, according to Zephaniah, tremble at God's judgment. If there is something unpopular today regarding truth, it is the fact that God judges. He is a God of wrath. He is a God of judgment. Because sin and rebellion is serious. So Zephaniah 1.7, if we play that passage on out, be silent before the sovereign Lord, for the day of the Lord is near. That word, the day of the Lord, very key with the prophets. The day of the Lord, that phrase is mentioned more times in Zephaniah than any other book of the Old, uh, of the Old Testament. So if I, I counted myself, when I saw the day of the Lord I counted about six times. When I counted up every time it said the day that had to do with the day of the Lord, 17 times it speaks of the day of the Lord. So what is the day of the Lord? It's the day when God will sweep away like cobwebs nations. Think of that, the sovereign God. Nations like a cobweb. He'll sweep them away. He'll cut off those who rebel against him, sweep them away. Also, he will continue to um, reign and be powerful in his presence and in his movement and his judgment to the degree that it will bring weeping, it will bring uh, distress, it will bring anguish coming from that wrath of God, ruin, devastation, darkness, gloom. I'll stop there. But that's the day of the Lord. So he's speaking chiefly here in Zephaniah to his own people. So what do we do with this? Well, we can see the day of the Lord upon his own people who were complacent because of the idolatry and self-sufficiency and the ungodliness and everything we've talked about, he's saying this punishment, this judgment comes for their correction. But it also comes to purge people. So all of God's people are the people of God. All of Israel are not all Israelites. So just as there are many Christians who say themselves Christians who are not Christians... So God brings judgment to purge. So if you go to Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 9, Zephaniah 3, verses 9 through 13, you'll see what's called, what we've been seeing, the remnant, which means there's Christians and then there's the true Christians, the remnant. And so there's this purging that comes to bring about a, a pushing away and a sweeping away of those who are never truly Christians to land with the remnant. So my question over the few weeks has been this, are you the remnant? Because God is purging right now, and it's just going to get stronger. He's purging Christianity, he's purging the church, and he's getting down to the remnant. Because it's the remnant in which he'll bring revival. The remnant, the remnant. First Peter chapter 4, verse 17, Peter picks this up. He says, for it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. So he's speaking of Christians, judgment coming there to purge and correct. But he's not just speaking to God's people, he's speaking to unbelievers, unbelieving nations. Zephaniah 2.5 says, the word of the Lord is against you. If you are not a believer in Jesus, if you are not born again, the word of the Lord is against you. Wrath is above you. 1 Peter 4.17, for it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God, and if it begins with the remnant, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? The obedience is salvation through faith by grace in Christ, born again as his child. What happens to those who do not obey, those who do not believe that? Well, we see wrath happens. Romans chapter 1, verse 17, talked about this already over the last few weeks. We often think of God's wrath as fire and brimstone and torment, where at first we see Romans chapter 1, verse 17, saying that God's wrath is him simply turning you over to you, giving you what you want, and that is you. And he doesn't convict you anymore. He doesn't, get, he doesn't mess with your conscience anymore. You are completely given over to his wrath now and his wrath forever. That ought to make you tremble. And then there's wrath that is hell, and that is torment. 
And this is what is frowned upon or, uh, uh, wow, against this in our culture. But here's the truth. Revelation chapter 6, 6, verses 16 and 17 says that when the wrath of God falls and is poured out on those who are unbelievers, the presence of the Lamb will be there. That's Jesus. And it says in that passage that they, they are crying out for the mountains to fall on them. Interestingly, they're not repenting. They want the mountains to fall upon them so that they do not see the presence of the Lamb. The Lamb is Jesus. Then Revelation chapter 14, verse 10 says that, the, that in, the, in the end, when unbelievers are in hell, the wrath of God will be poured out in the presence of the Lamb. So that means hell has the presence of God. How can that be? Because hell is God minus love. Hell is God minus mercy and God minus grace. After all your whole life, you could have turned to God and been his forever. You've rejected him to the end, and therefore you get judgment. You get hell. You know, there's a, there's a, I I came across this on social media, this comedian, and I don't want to endorse her, but there's really this comedian. She's a famous comedian, and she's standing in front of a mic talking, I guess, YouTube, and literally her words are, I promise y'all there's no hell. I promise. That was her whole thing. There's no hell. And I promise, oh, I promise there's no hell. And you know what? Because she's a famous comedian, many people are going to believe her. Can I just say something right now, y'all, especially our teenagers? Don't don't believe somebody just because they have six-pack abs. Don't believe somebody because they can sing really well and they're championed by culture. Don't believe people because they have the perfect body and the most followers on social media. Listen to your pastor. I love you. And I don't have six-pack abs. But I love you. And I love you enough to tell you the truth. And this is truth. This is truth. And you may not want to come back because of it. I totally understand. I've been there. But I'm telling you, don't listen to the comedian. Listen to your pastor. This is truth. Your eternity hangs in the balance. You die without Christ. You go to hell. Jesus said this, not just the pastor. So how can this be love, though? Where is love in all of this, right? That is the question. Where is love in all of this? Remember, to enjoy the fireworks of the the love of mercy and grace of God, you've got to see the dark sky. You don't don't celebrate fireworks against the, the noonday sun. You celebrate it when it's against the dark sky. So we're understanding this dark sky of the wrath and the judgment of God over sin. Sin is serious, y'all. Look at the cross. God, through Christ, was butchered on the cross for the joy set before him to make you right with God. He took hell on your behalf so that on the cross we see this judgment of God, but we see the mercy of God for us. Let me give you this example that I came across. It's, It's not perfect, but it's helpful. So take this, for example, take... The, say these two guys were best friends growing up all the way, best friends in the college, really loved each other, close friendships. And then over time, they kind of grew apart. And then one day, the, the one friend became a judge, and the other friend got into a life of crime. So you have the, uh, the judge and the criminal. So the criminal kids commits this crime, and he comes before the judge to receive the penalty. So when the criminal shows up, his best friend is the judge and sees the criminal that's his best friend. And he loves his best friend, and he doesn't want to condemn him. He doesn't want to, he doesn't want to make him guilty for the crime because he loves him. So, but he has to. He has to because he's the judge, and there must be justice. So what is he going to do? He says, you are guilty. You are guilty, and you must be punished because you are guilty for your crime. That's justice, isn't it? That's judgment. But then here's what happens. The judge gets out from behind the bench, he walks down, he takes his robe off, and he takes the fine that the the criminal owes, and he writes it out of his own account and gives it to him and says, you are free. That's called mercy. 
Not a perfect example, but it's a picture. When Jesus goes, because of our sin, the scriptures declare you and I are guilty. We've committed cosmic crime through a rejection and a rebellion from the very souls. We were born with clenched fists toward God. And there we are. And we are declared guilty by God. We deserve execution because God is holy and we are sinners. But what happens? Jesus takes off his robe of glory. And he comes to you and me. And he goes to the cross and the check is written by Jesus taking on the judgment, the hell that we deserved that you and I might find mercy. That, y'all, is love. That's love. That's a love you ought to marvel at. It's a love that you ought to tremble at because of what the Lord has done for you and me. Focus, respond. Focus, respond. But now, now that we focus and we marvel and hopefully we tremble, now what do we do? Well, seek the Lord. You, you focus, now respond by seeking the Lord. Seek the Lord, says the prophet. All you humble of the land who do his just command, seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you may be hidden on the day of the anger of the Lord. It's interesting, Zephaniah's name means hidden, shelter. So what do we do? You seek the Lord. Hum, humble yourself. That means you come to a place and you understand and you embrace, I am a sinner before God. But through faith in Christ, I died with him on the cross. In his death, my sin was punished in him and on my behalf. And in his resurrection, I am raised with him unto new life. And as you see that, you respond to that by seeking the Lord through your life, seeking him through the word, seeking him through prayer, seeking him through repentance, humbling yourself and, and, and repenting. So here's what I've been trying to teach us about repentance uh, again. So if we're up in a plane and we have parachutes and this is cool thing we're going to do and we're all going to jump out, if you're like me, you're not going to do it You're gonna because I hate heights and you're going to have the... I'm going to have my backpack or my backpack parachute on, and I'm going to get to the edge, and I'm going to go, no, I'm not doing this, and I'm going to turn around. What happened is I was about to do it, and then I repented. I changed my mind. That's what repentance is. It's seeing your life of sin and saying, nope, not going to go there, not going to do it, and turning from it. Seeing a temptation, nope, not going to go there. Temptation is not sin, but even if there's sin, you turn from it. Okay, here's another way of understanding it. I talked about amusement park with my daughter, I should have learned my lesson with my son when I took him years ago. He wanted to go on this one ride. And I'm 6'7". Rides are not meant for 6'7 people. Just put that out there. So I got locked down into this thing, and it was the most terrifying ride of my adult life. And so when I got off of that, trying to hold it all together, I said to myself, I will never do that ever again. You know what that's called? Repentance. I did it. It cost me. Learned my lesson. Will never do it again. What is that in your life that you're looking at right now that you should say, I'm not going to do it? What is it in your life that you should look at and say, I'm never doing it again? That's repentance. Focus, respond with your life. There's this repentance. There's this humility, obedience. Jesus said in John chapter 14, if you love me, you will obey me. See, listen, if you say you love Jesus, that doesn't, that doesn't show up that you love him because you sing some songs. The way you know you love him is if you obey what he says. John chapter 14, verse 15. He's your refuge. You, you see him as your shelter. Think of a, I remember when Christy was pregnant, right? Or when, when, the lady, when the lady's pregnant, you had a baby within you. Wherever the mother goes, the baby goes. It's within. The baby's hidden within, but the baby goes where the mother goes, and the baby receives what the mother receives. In the same way, when you're hidden in Christ, you're in him. You go where he goes, and you receive from heaven from him. That's to be hidden in him. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 2 says, listen, accept correction, trust, and draw near. Zephaniah 3, 7, 8, accept correction. So that's another way of seeking the Lord, saying where he's correcting you in your life and repenting and turning fully to him. Seek the Lord. Secondly, respond by singing with your heart. Sing with all your heart. doesn't mean just sing from the heart, not your lips. But you sing from your heart through your lips. Watch this. Zephaniah this isn't on the screen, but listen to what it says. Chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. Is that good news? 
That's good news. So what should you do in light of the good news? How should you respond? Zephaniah 3.14, sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. Sing. You know what the two biggest commands are in Scripture? Pray, sing. I dream of the day that we sing so loud together that it's deafening. I dream of the day that while we're singing, people are shouting. Because if God is true, if this is true, and he is sovereign, and he has judgment but his love, and he is worthy and worth all of our lives, that's worth our singing our hearts out and shouting to his glory. Now, notice earlier in the passage, it's not on the screen, it says he has taken away your judgment. He has cleared away your enemies. He is in your midst, he, you will never again have to fear evil. When he's in your midst and in you, this is who you have. And so it made me think about how you may come to a place like this or even in your life and you just say, I, I don't have it in me to sing, Pastor. I'm weary. I have enemies and I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm exhausted and there's sediment and sludge and I just don't have it in me to sing. And, you, and it's because you feel defeated. There's a, a defeated place in you. Or maybe you're going through a season of injustice and oppression and enemies and you're just worn out and there's no victory in sight. Well, it's to be reminded that there is victory. Whether you feel it or not, there is victory. <laughs> right now it feels like surviving. Everybody been in that mode? Survival. Even in your survival you have victory. And that ought to move you to sing. How about this? So I have a buddy who has recorded every New York Giants game for years, y'all. VH tape, VHS tapes to the ceiling in rows. It's unbelievable. So I was thinking about how if you recorded a football game, say you're whatever your team is, let's just go with the Giants. I know that I've just committed an abomination to the Jets fans, but let's just say the Giants is the team. And so you want to see the game, but you can't see the game, so you record the game. And you don't want anybody to tell you the score because you want to see what happens. But you find out the score and you find out the Giants have won by two touchdowns. So you go to watch the game that afternoon. And as you're watching it, you start getting caught up in the moment. You start getting frustrated and upset because your quarterback fumbled the ball. And then he threw an interception. And then the other team scored and you're going, oh, what is going on? And then you stop and you go, what am I getting so upset about? We won. You with me? So when you come and you feel defeated, you ought to remember, you've won in Christ. He knows the bigger picture, so sing your heart out. Shout to the Lord. That'll wake up the sediment. Yeah? So sing with your heart. Seek the Lord. Sing with your heart. And finally, savor his love. Savor his love. One of my favorite pastors said this. He says, we want we want someone we think the world of to think the world of us. My daughter, Jubilee, so she's just a bubbly, <laughs> she's like a little light. She just bounces around like a little light. And last year, earlier in the year, she was being Jubilee. I mean, her name suits her, funny and happy and laughing and singing and dancing and and this one day, I just said, Jubilee, you are so happy. She looked all cute. I said, you're so happy. I think I've shared this before, but you're so happy. And I said, baby, why are you so happy? And she goes, because you love me, Daddy. <laughs> it's called savoring love. When you look upon God... And you say, because you love me, I will seek you. I will sing to you. I will live for you. I will forgive. I will let go. I will trust. Zephaniah says, fear not. Don't let your hands grow weak in that weariness. The love will bring strength back. Watch. The Lord your God is in your midst, remnant. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. 
He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. Notice the repetition. You, 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 not y'all, 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 you. It's personal. God is personally singing over you. He's in his midst, y'all. When he created in Genesis, he did not create by singing. He created by speaking and worlds happen. Imagine if he sang. He saved his singing for you. He sings over you, exalts over you in Christ Jesus. Savor this love. Savor this love. So when I was a kid, and we were growing really, you know, you hit that age, you just, you grow, you outgrow everything about every three, six months. And so my mom would take me and my sister to department stores. Remember department stores, anybody? For Amazon? Yeah. Some of you teenagers are like, what? Store what? So department stores, and we would try on clothes, and this is when I was really young. And of course, like many kids, you get lost. You stray from your parent and you get lost. And I can remember doing that a few times. I remember one was worse than the other. I actually remember it, and I was terrified. And it was a big place. There were tons of people, and it was intimidating. It was loud and, and completely lost. And I began to panic, and I began to cry. And then all of a sudden, out of the, out of the oceans of people, my mom walked through, and she reached down and picked me up and held me. And as my mom's arms held me, my tears began to dry my heart began to settle. Peace began to overcome me because that love overwhelmed me. Here's the kicker. My surroundings hadn't changed. So it didn't mean my surroundings and my circumstances had to change. It only had to do with whose arms I was in. When someone loves you, when someone who loves you holds you, it doesn't matter what's going on. It just matters those arms you're in. The Lord your God sings over you. He exalts over you. He is in your midst. Do you believe it? Don't walk out of here today with sediment in your heart. If you're having a hard time breaking through, lift up your voice. Focus on his greatness, on his judgment that reveals more fireworky his love. And seek him and sing to him and savor him and trust him to stir that sediment up and get it out. And you be his forever. Lord, thank you for this good word to us today. I pray none of, here, none of us leave here the same that something has been stirred and awakened. Yeah. You're the God over all I know. So to you be praise in Christ Jesus. We give you all the glory. In your name I pray. Amen.